Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video and another instalment of my series Revisiting, where I usually look back on one particular album. Today's going to be a bit different. I'm going to actually look at three albums together, and uh, that's because they often are seen as a trio. In a way, I'll explain why in a moment. So we've got uh, Goat's Head Soup by the Rolling Stones, It's Rock and Roll, also by the Rolling Stones, and can you guess the third one? We've got um, Black and Blue by the Rolling Stones. Now, I don't talk too much about the Stones on my channel, uh, or I haven't done anyway. Thinking about seven years of making videos, I've only made a couple of videos looking at them, so I thought it was about time. And I was wondering what to do, whether to look at one particular album, one particular classic album. And, um, you know, the Stones arguably have got two great periods where they were seen as being a fantastic rock and roll band, R&B band. You've got the early periods, all those great early singles, you know, Satisfaction, Get Off My Cloud. And then moving into the Jimmy Miller era where you had some great singles also. You've got Jumping Jack Flash, Honky Tonk Women. But then that great, great run of albums starting with Beggar's Banquet in 68, I think, running through Let It Bleed and then Sticky Fingers and culminating in Exile on Main Street. And um, that, critically, that is the period of the Stones which gets the most praise, really, the Mick Taylor era. And when I first got into the Stones back in the 90s, I knew nothing about them at all. I read the Victor Botchris Keith Richards biography, which is very illuminating. And in that, uh, he talked quite a lot in that about the fact that there'd been this great period from the late 60s to the early 70s of great, just Stone Cold, st um, Stones classics. And then really from Goat's Head Soup through the 70s up until Some Girls, uh, you had this period where the Stones didn't exactly lose their way. I mean, commercially, in fact, they started doing very well indeed. You know, the 1970s was the decade when they really came into their own as a huge arena band, stadium attraction, but critically they started to dip and it was perceived that their golden period maybe had come to an end. Um, Goat's Head Soup was the last album that they did with Jimmy Miller after which things took a bit of a different turn really. Now, so I'd been, I'd been aware of this, this, you know, this idea that there was this great period of Stones music. When I first started buying Rolling Stones records, the first ones I picked up were the classic ones. You know, I got the Let It Bleed, I got the Beggar's Banquet, Sticky Fingers, Exile. And round about that time, I, I had a, a magazine. It was a back issue of Musician Magazine, which is a, a US magazine. <clears throat> and in that, there was a great interview with Mick Jagger. And the interviewer, I remember the phrase, he talked about... Um, the Stones doldrums period and it was in reference to Some Girls which came out uh, in the late 1970s and it was it was widely perceived as having been a shot in the arm for the Stones took them back to a much raunchier much more raw sound and I guess it plugged them into some of the contemporary music things that were happening at the time so you had the punk scene breaking obviously you know Keith did used to frequent the punk clubs in New York and in London too and they were they were vibing off that music but also disco you know Mick had been embroiled in the New York gay club scene for a while absorbing those sounds so the Some Girls album was seen as being a definite shot in the arm Exile on Main Street meanwhile in the first part of the 1970s had been seen in retrospect as this great high watermark even though at the time critically it maybe wasn't quite as critically adored as we now like to think and then in the meantime in the intervening years you had these years which were characterized in that interview um, by that journalist as the doldrum year so you had goat's head soup you had it's only rock and roll and then you had um, black and blue so these three albums were not a priority for me at all it was quite a long time before i started to pick them up and um, as usual with these things you know when you come to certain records which have maybe a negative critical reception you're often surprised at how much you enjoy them and that certainly rings true for all three of these records I don't think any of them are true top draw classic stones so apologies to Richard McCook I know that uh, Goat's Head Soup is Richard's um, favourite stones album ever and I would say in fact that this one of the three that we're going to look at today this is the one which now retrospectively has started to be reclaimed a little bit I think Jimmy Miller was definitely burnt out at the time this album was recorded in uh, in Jamaica 
has a very murky sound. I think Jimmy was coming off the rails trying to keep up with Keith and uh, I think after the huge explosion of, of music and just great vibes which was Exile on Main Street, it's a very mysterious dark and dirty album. Um, this one was only ever going to be seen as a bit of an anticlimax, but I, I think in retrospect quite a lot of Stones fans now do view this as being kind of almost up there really and uh, you know the Stones golden period in the eyes of some now extends into the goat's head soup era rather than stopping at exile which is an interesting perspective but um, historically I don't think that was how this album was viewed so just a quick bit of background then this um, this album came out on the 31st of August 1973 and uh, it was recorded at Dynamic Sound Studios in Jamaica and um, I guess one thing that we should say, or that I should say at this point, is that this really represents the time period where Keith was, I was going to say, starting to sink into heroin addiction. Clearly that had already happened. If you read the very lurid stories about Exile on Main Street, the recording of that record, Keith was already uh, on the rocks. He was already sinking deep into drug addiction. But um, when you get into the 70s and when you get into the post-exile period, I think it is a period where Mick Jagger was starting to come into the ascendant. Keith's influence on the band was starting to go down a little bit. And maybe that, again, is, is a reason why, those, uh, why these albums from the 70s are kind of viewed perhaps not as, as critically acclaimed as, as those great run of records from the late 60s, early 70s, because Keith's influence seemed to be on the wane. Bill Wyman actually only plays bass on three tracks on the album. The majority of the bass duties were handled by Keith Richards and Mick Taylor. And again, this is the era now where you're starting to see these guest musicians coming in. So on this record, you've got Billy Preston, the keyboard maestro who'd been on um, Let It Be by the Beatles. Nicky Hopkins, the great um, British keyboard player, session guy, he starts to come into the picture here and he starts to make his presence felt. And Ian Stewart, of course, uh, who'd been the original um, Stones founder, really, who'd been kicked out of the band for not looking right, and then they kept him on as a roadie. He plays on this record too. So um, the album is is definitely a bit of a mixed bag, I think. You've got the opening track, which uh, is um, Dancing with Mr. D, which I don't think, I don't think really uh, kept the side up. In terms of some of the stuff that had been going into the first position place and some of the previous albums, you know, think of Gimme Shelter, uh, think of Brown Sugar, think of Rocks, you know, really, really strong album openers. Dancing with Mr. D, it, it's quite good fun, but I don't think it's, it's a real classic, classic album opener by the Stones. But then track two, 100 Years Ago, is it's just a fantastic Stones song. It's really dirty, it's really groovy, it's got a great sound to it, that kind of murky sound, uh, but um, it just sounds absolutely fantastic. One of my all-time favourite Stones songs. Coming Down Again has a definite post-smack kind of feel. Very hazy, very woozy, quite an agonised song, really. It's got a great Keith vocal, but it's uh, it's quite a heavy song. It's not the kind of thing that you put on to have a party, exactly. Um, do, 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 do <laughs> is the next track. And again, it's a fantastic, absolutely fantastic Stone song. Rollicks along, and um, it's just a tremendous band performance. Absolutely love it. Angie at the end of side one, obviously, is one of the Stones' biggest hits. Um, quite a maudlin song I suppose but it did show the Stones in a new light trying something a bit different you know I think in general during this period it's the Stones searching for an identity trying to fit in with what's happening in the 1970s I think one of the reasons why the Stones were so critically lauded in the late 60s early 70s period was a couple of different reasons the first reason is I think they started to really delve deep down into into kind of early blues stuff Keith learnt the open tuning from Ry Kudo and they started to drill down into some very eerie sounding country blues type material from the 30s and that gave their material a more acoustic, strange old world kind of vibe really, influenced by the band of course. But then also they had the political thing coming in, think of Street Fighting Man, you know Jagger started to write these really interesting edgy lyrics which seemed to have a political bent to them. And for a while, the Stones really seemed to be one of those bands that were riding the zeitgeist, really. They were writing, or Mick was writing about stuff that was happening at the time, you know, the civil rights movement. You had the whole fallout from Altamont, that gimme shelter vibe to it. 
as you move into the 1970s, uh, the Stones, they kind of lose that edge and they turn into more of a... Well, I think for a start, they turn into just a kind of mass entertainment arena, good time rock and roll band. And then also then they start to sink into this absolute kind of degradation of just cocaine snorting, um, you know, grand league mega stars, at least from Mick's point of view anyway, this sort of curious dichotomy where, you know, Mick is kind of ascending into these fabulous heights of stardom Keith meanwhile is on his way down into the gutter so there's a sort of curious um, twin effect there you know these guys pulling in different directions but um, musically the Stones starting to maybe question their well not question exactly but starting to try to find their feet in the new decade starting to compete with all the stuff that was happening and, and just trying trying different things trying to stretch out into new areas Goat's Head Soup, side two. It's not a bad side. You've got Silver Train, which is a bit routine, really. Hide Your Love is okay. Winter is one of those songs you have to be in the mood for. It's quite ethereal sounding, quite strange sounding. It's it's kind of okay, but it's not vintage stones. Um, can You Hear the Music? Again, quite experimental, quite interesting. Not the kind of thing you'd expect from them. Um, and then the album finishes with Star Star, which is which went on to be one of their big arena rock numbers. So I think a bit of a mishmash, really, all told. And um, the Stones trying on different musical outfits, trying to work out what fits. Jimmy Miller burning out, maybe he doesn't have quite so much influence anymore. So at the time of the record's release, actually, Mick Jagger really, really came out in praise of the album. Mick had never been a big fan of Exile on Main Street. I think he thought that it hadn't had enough pop hooks on it, his vocals were mixed down, it was it was hard to hear the hook sometimes. Talking about Goat's Head Soup though, he said, um, I really feel close to this album and I really put all I had into it. The tracks are much more varied than the last one, I didn't want it to just be a bunch of rock songs. So you can hear there that in Mick's eyes this album was definitely a career advancement, an artistic advancement, and I think it is interesting during this period, he is definitely starting to seize the reins. He's starting to view the Stones as a vehicle for doing 1970s pop rock material and really trying to evolve and leave behind some of the stuff they've been doing before. And because Keith was in such a state, he wasn't really in a position to challenge that. So the album was was had some mixed reviews. Lester Bangs, the infamous rock critic, he um, writing for Cream magazine, he said. There is a sadness about the Stones now because they amount to such an enormous so what. And Greg Shaw of Phonograph Records said that the record had no redeeming qualities whatsoever and he found nothing good about it. Um, it didn't get universally panned though. Charlie Gillette of Let It Rock magazine, he said that with Goat's Head Soup, the Stones finally ousted their rivals as the world's greatest rock band and he deemed it their first LP, which is unquestionably the best rocking groove of its time. So it's interesting that the album was not was not completely panned, it did have its fans, but um, in terms of being universally regarded as a great record, um, not quite so much. So then we move on to It's Only Rock and Roll, and this is the first record not to be produced by um, Jimmy Miller, the first one since um, Beggar's Banquet. So this... Uh, um, on this album, Mick and Keith produced themselves for the first time since uh, this, the Satanic Majesties record, and it's the first time that they credit themselves as the Glimmer Twins. So this record is the start, I think, of a new era for the Stones. The production is much smoother, much clearer than the stuff they've been doing before. It has a contemporary 1970s feel to it. It's kind of lacking a bit of that swampy groove that Jimmy Miller got into the track. It's starting to sound much more like a kind of crystal clear, nice sounding mainstream rock record. Um, parts of it were recorded at Musicland Studios, Georgia Moroder's famed studio in, uh, in Munich after the Stones' European tour of 1973. Uh, got to number one in the US and number two in the UK. And again, this album uh, starts to feature this this roll call of musicians again. So you've got um, Ian Stewart again, Nicky Hopkins is back, and his contributions start to become more and more noticeable and florid on this record. Billy Preston again, and this is the first album to feature the percussionist Ray Cooper, who was going to go and have a very long association with the Stones. Obviously, he was already somebody who'd been hanging out with George Harrison a lot. 
And this record is interesting because it's the first time that there's um, a major Stones hit uh, on which um, Charlie Watts doesn't play and Keith Richards almost didn't play either, which is the title track, It's Only Rock and Roll, the sessions for which I think they went down during the recording sessions for Ronnie Wood's first solo album, maybe. I've got my own album to do. Um, those sessions had people like Willie Weeks, Andy Newmark, or maybe it was Kenny Jones from The Faces. Anyway, they recorded the song. Mick Jagger really liked it, and then he got uh, he got Keith to overdub some guitars onto it as well. So, um, you know, quite a quite a significant moment, really. Keith had always been absolutely at the heart of the engine room of the Stones. You know, writing with Mick and building things up from his guitar onwards. And here, for the first time, he's almost well, he is guesting on somebody else's track in a way. Um, so this record, again, well, you know, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. It does have some great material, or at least some good material. The opening track is an improvement, I think, on Dancing with Mr. D. You've got If You Can't Rock Me, uh, which is a reasonable rocker, I think. It has a quite a raw sound. I don't think it's top drawer stones, but it's enjoyable. Uh, a not too great cover of Ain't Too Proud to Beg, the Old Temptation song, which is a bit, a bit routine, really. Then the big hit, It's Only Rock and Roll, which is a concert staple for the Stones. It's never really been a big favourite of mine, but it's okay. A bit of a countryish song, Till the Next Goodbye, which is maybe trying to ring some more of the Angie magic. Uh, but uh, it's kind of alright, it's, it's quite pleasant. I wouldn't say it's anything too special. Time Waits for No One at the end of side one is one of the great... Um, moments on this record, Mick Taylor wanted a songwriting credit because he'd made a contribution. His guitar playing on it is really spectacular. And uh, I guess in the same way that um, Till the Next Goodbye, you know, these two tracks, that one and Time Waits for No One, they're just, they're quite obscure. You know, they've never been played in concert to my knowledge. They're not played on the radio. They have this kind of hidden quality to them. And I suppose they're interesting songs because they don't follow that kind of you know, the predictable Stones pattern that we all know now from the last 30 years of Rolling Stones records. They sound like they're trying to imbibe some of their influences, maybe even a touch of Elton John coming through, you know. Now, whether you want to say that's, that makes for great Stones music, I don't know. I'm not 100% convinced. I think with these records, you've got to sort of, you've got to take them for what they are, really, and, um, you know, find them quite interesting in that respect. But that track... Time Waits for No One. I mean, some of the guitar work that Mick Taylor does is, is incredibly florid and uh, beautiful sounding. It's not what you'd expect from the Stones at all. Um, but, you know, certainly an interesting moment. Side two, it's got some lesser stuff on it. Luxury, which people have always claimed that, that was a bit of a reggae song, but it, it's not played in a reggae style. Mick does a bit of a dodgy Jamaican accent in it, which is never a good idea. Dance Little Sister is a, more of a traditional Stone song. It's quite crunchy, it's quite good fun, uh, it's quite well played. It, you know, it's a good jukebox song, a barroom song. If You Really Want to Be My Friend is another slow, uh, slow atmospheric ballad um, with some interesting organ stuff on there and some nice backing vocals. And um, But again, though, you know, it, it's, not, it's not really what you kind of want from the Stones, I suppose. That's what, I think that's what people talk about when they mention the this being the doldrums period for the Stones, if you compare it to the stuff that's on Some Girls, it just seems to have this kind of slightly like like a daisical quality about it, you know, as if they're not quite firing on all cylinders. Short and Curly's is a bit of a silly, inconsequential song, really, quite banal. But then the record ends with an absolutely fabulous track, Fingerprint File, with some superb bass playing from Bill Wyman. It's a kind of song of urban paranoia, really, a bit of a kind of uh, wanted by the FBI kind of vibe to it. It really reminds me of those great sort of 1970s cop shows. And um, it's just a fabulous track. It really does sound incredible. And it shows the Stones moving into more of a funky, or was it moving into more of an R&B area? There'd always been an R&B band, but um, I think it had started to get a little bit adulterated now. They were starting to dally with ballads and pop songs and that kind of thing. So I think Fingerprint File, actually what it did do is it kind of signposted the way really to Black and Blue, which is the album where they really did go out all out funk, R&B, bit of disco coming through. So um, this is the third and last record that we're going to look at today. Actually, just before we do, just a, just a quick bit of press um, about It's Only Rock and Roll. I've got some quotes here. 
Um, we've got Lester Bangs. This album is false, numb, but it cuts like a dull blade. Uh, so again, he wasn't very impressed with this. But then John Landau in Rolling Stone, he said, It's only rock and roll is one of the most intriguing and mysterious, as well as the darkest of all Rolling Stone's records. So again, not the complete critical disaster that... Um, uh, that it's sometimes viewed as. This was, of course, the final album to feature Mick Taylor. He wasn't very impressed that um, he hadn't been given a songwriting credit for the... I think there were two songs in this record he wanted credits for. Till the Last Goodbye and Time Waits for No One. Uh, he felt he'd had a hand in those, but he was not to get a credit. So, moving on to Black and Blue, uh, which came out on the 23rd of April, 1976. Again, parts of this were recorded at Musicland Studios. I think there were also some sessions at Island Records and um, at Mick Jagger's house as well. Reached number two in the UK, uh, spent four weeks at number one in the US, went platinum. So, you know, the Stones are not, they're not falling off the, the radar commercially. They're still a huge concert draw. But this is the record where they've lost Mick Taylor and they're, they're basically using the album as a way of auditioning guitarists, really. So on this record you have Wayne Perkins, he plays on Hand of Fate and Fool to Cry. Harvey Mandel is on Hot Stuff and Memory Motel. Ronnie Wood, who of course uh, is the guy that would go on to be the Stones guitarist, he plays on Cherry O' Baby. Uh, Negrita, in which he gets a songwriting credit because he, um, well, he always claimed to initiate the riff for that, so he did get a credit for that. And then Crazy Mama at the end. So three different guitarists there. Also, they had Rory Gallagher and Jeff Beck coming in to jam with them during the sessions. Neither of them wanted to join the Stones. <laughs> I think Jeff Beck said he played three chords for eight hours and said he just needed to have something a bit more stimulating than that. Um, Rory Gallagher was never going to join the Stones. He was too much of his own man, really. But you know, quite a unique album in their catalogue with all these guitarists milling around. Also, you've got the other guest musicians as well. Nicky Hopkins is here again, Billy Preston, the percussionist Ollie E. Brown. So this album is quite different from It's Only Rock and Roll. It's got a much more of a dancey vibe to it. It's got much more of a kind of disco-y thing going on, but a funk going on. Um, starts out with Hot Stuff, which is it's good fun. It's it's a grooving track. It's quite it's it's, you know, it's quite a good dance track. Um, Hand of Fate, the second song by Jagger Richards, is is a f yeah fairly solid Stone song. It's pretty good. Cherry O' Baby, um, I think Charlie Watts should be commended really for doing a good job of that track. You know, if you compare it to Jamaica by Led Zeppelin from Houses of the Holy, where John Bonham showed his utter contempt, really, for reggae by refusing to play a proper reggae drum beat. Charlie actually does do quite a good job of playing in the reggae style um, for that song. Um, this song was written by Eric Donaldson, the Jamaican songwriter, of course, but um, is, it, is it a song the Stones should be doing? I don't know. It's, it's kind of okay. Memory Motel at the end of side one is another one of these long, drawn-out, kind of ballady songs. Um, it's okay, it's, again, you're sort of thinking, is this Elton John or is it the Stones, you know? It's very, very um, over-arranged, over uh, very um, sophisticated for the Stones. Uh, again, you know, a million miles away from the stuff that was going to appear on um, on some girls. Hey Negrita on side two, which is the Richards and, uh, well, I say it was meant to be credited to Ron Wood. I'm just looking at the back here. I always thought he did get a credit, but he doesn't quite. It is um, it is credited to Richard Jagger, but it says inspiration by Ron Wood. So they couldn't quite face giving him a full credit, but he does get an inspiration credit. Melody, which is a bit of a tiresome, jazzy number. I think that was inspired by Billy Preston, and it has quite a lot of Billy Preston on it. Not too successful, really. Um, Fool to Cry is a great Stone song. Again, it's another ballad, so it's got that kind of soft, um, sad kind of quality to it. But it's actually a really nice song. It's just about a guy who comes home after a hard day, and his daughter sits on his knee and sees that he's crying, you know, and says, "You know, Daddy, you're a fool to cry." I think it's a lovely song, actually, but it's not exactly an exciting Stone song. But then once again they pull a rabbit out of the hat with the final track, Crazy Mama, which is uh, which, which has got Ron Wood on it, which is just a fantastic, fantastic Stone song. Um, <clears throat> it's just got great, great guitar interplay on it. Brilliant drumming by Charlie Watts, just one of their greatest ever moments. 
So just like Fingerprint File had ended, it's only rock and roll in fine style, you've got Crazy Mama coming at the end of this record, and it, I suppose it really showed that the Stones still had what it took. And um, I think it's true for all of these records, you know, none of them, none of them are terrible, they all have good moments on them. It's just that you, there's this feeling that you're having to kind of cut through some other stuff in order to get to the good things, but, you know, even so... Keith, in 1977, um, was fairly dismissive of this record. So, that, you know, again, at this point, he was he was very deep into heroin. He said the album wasn't very good, certainly nowhere as good as Let It Bleed, um, although he did apparently reappraise the album in 1984. In the 90s, um, Mick Jagger said that this period was, uh, well, he said it was a bit of a holiday period. I mean, we cared, but we didn't care as much as we had, not really concentrating on the creative process. And I guess there is the sense on this record, there's maybe not a great deal of focused songwriting going on. There's quite a lot of studio jams which are being tarted up uh, into songs rather than being fully-fledged songs. And when they do write songs, they tend to be these kind of long, over-elaborated ballads. So something strange going on in the, in the Stones dynamic, but... Um, that's the way it went. So again, we have here Lester Bang in Cream magazine describes the album, the heat's off, it's all over, they really don't matter anymore or stand for anything. This is the first meaningless Rolling Stones album, and thank God. Um, but then again, there was the alternative viewpoint. Robert Criscow commended the band for taking musical risks, and he singled out Hot Stuff and Fools to Cry for, for particular praise, and then said, diagnosis not dead by a long shot and uh, of course the stones were not dead by a long shot once Ronnie was in the band Keith was going to start to get himself um, off the smack and things were going to start to turn around some girls came along in the late 70s and like I was saying at the start of the video the disco influence the punk influence was going to come through give them a shot in the arm and then the stones were going to have another great period Maybe not too long lived. The two albums after that, or there was one album after that, which was um, which was perceived as not being as good. But then you went into Tattoo You, which uh, you know again was another the return to form. So anyway, that was my look at the Stones in the Doldrums period. I'd be glad to hear of any um, any views that you might have about those three records. Are they are they great? Are they great period Stones records? Are they write offs? Are they somewhere in between? My view is that they are somewhere in between. They've all got some really good stuff on them, uh, but um, you know they're not the period of stones that you'd maybe play to somebody first if they didn't know anything about the band. All right, thanks for watching. I'll be back soon. See you next time.